If you have your Bibles, we'll be in Acts chapter 27. We're still in our sermon series on the book of Acts. But uh, I remember when I was about a sophomore in high school, I think, as far as I can remember back, I was about a sophomore in high school, and I went with four of my, my buddies. We rode our bicycles to Lake Shelbyville one weekend for a weekend of camping and fishing. I mean, we did that quite a few times in different uh, places. In fact, my buddy Mike's here, and we rode to Mount Vernon on our bikes one time. I know we had crazy parents, I guess. Anyway, uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, we went to uh, Lake Shelbyville on our bikes, and it was a beautiful, sunshiny day when we started out. But about the time we got down to the lake, we were almost there. These dark clouds started rolling in, and pretty soon they were black clouds. The whole sky turned black, and the winds picked up to the point where we couldn't ride our bikes anymore. We had to get off our bikes and push them, and thank the Lord, we happened to be going by a farmer's house. He must have been looking out the window and saw us struggling. He said, boys, get in the garage, and he opened the garage door to a detached garage not too far from their house. So we pushed our bicycles into the garage and sheltered in there while the storm blew over. I thought that little garage was going to blow away. It didn't. Uh, but that storm, it had to be a tornado uh, that blew through. But God spared us. I'm thankful for that. Uh, but maybe you or someone you know have been in a bad storm. We're going to be talking about going through storms today. Maybe you or someone you know been in a bad storm, maybe even a tornado, because storms can be terrifying. They can even be deadly. Today we're going to be talking about a storm that the Apostle Paul went through. Uh, except his was way worse. You know why? Because he was out at sea when he went through the storm. I've never experienced a storm at sea, but I've heard that they can be the most petrifying and terrifying storms out there. And we've been walking through the book of Acts for a couple of months now. We're coming to the end of the book. We're almost through with the series. But the entire book, if you remember, is about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem to the ends of the world. And for Paul, if you remember, he's always wanted to go to Rome to take the gospel. But what happened? Over and over again, something blocked him. Something stopped him from going. And usually it was the Holy Spirit. And you know why? Because it wasn't yet the right time. It wasn't yet the due time. Remember also, Paul had spent two years in prison. He spent a lot more than that. But recently, in our text, he spent two years in prison. And then we read about how when, when he was in prison, the Lord himself came to Paul, stood beside him, and encouraged him and said, For as, I have as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so is it necessary for you to testify in Rome. So God is promising Paul he's going to go to Rome. The only thing he doesn't fill Paul in on is the details. He doesn't tell him when. He doesn't tell him how he's going to get there. Just, Paul, you're going to go. Paul, because he was unjustly uh, imprisoned, had appealed to Caesar meaning that he was going to stand before Caesar on trial. Guess where he goes to stand before Caesar? Rome. Then Paul, because uh, he's unjustly uh, imprisoned, appealed to Caesar. Uh, I think I just read that. Anyway, so as we look at Acts chapter 27, Paul begins his journey by ship to Rome. He believes, and I believe with him, that he's in the center of God's will. He's in the middle of God's will even when things are falling apart even when things aren't going well. How many have found out sometimes when life is falling apart, you can still be in God's will? God still has a way and a purpose to get you where he wants you to go, even through the hardest of times. But Paul always thought that he's going to go to Rome. He'll probably go as a missionary or a preacher. He doesn't go to, go to Rome as a preacher. He goes as a prisoner. He goes as a convict. And it's like God is saying to Paul, Paul, yes, you're going to go. I'm definitely going to get you to Rome. But here's the catch, Paul. You're going to have to go as a prisoner. And Paul, you're going to be a prisoner, and you're also going to have to go on a prison ship. Paul hadn't planned that. This story kind of reads like a novel. It's really exciting when you read through it. And if you put yourself in this story and use your imagination a little bit, you realize just how frightening all this really was. Today, we're going to be looking at this storm that Paul went through because God's going to teach us something about going through storms. Because all of us, I mean all of us, no one's exempt, all of us, as we sail through life, we're going to go through storms. Remember, Jesus says, in this life, you will have trouble. He didn't say you won't have trouble. He says you will have trouble. So every single person, every person is going to face heartaches. You're going to face troubles. You're going to have difficult trials. 
Every single person who lives or who has ever lived has had trouble. No matter how successful or how happy they seem to be, as I said, no one's exempt. No one is exempt. Remember what Job said? Job said, man is born to trouble as surely as the sparks fly upward. He's saying just as, a, as sparks from a, flyer, a fire fly upward, so you're going to have trouble. It's an, almost an automatic thing in life. You're going to have trouble. So we all have our storm stories. Some are worse than others. But I believe this chapter shows us how we should cope with our storms, how we should deal with our storms, because we're all going to have them. I want to start reading in Acts chapter 27, verse 1, if you have your Bibles. It says, when it was decided that we, let me focus on the we for just a minute. This is Luke talking, because remember, it's Luke that's writing the book of Acts. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Adraminium, about, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. So this Julius guy that was mentioned is Paul's handler. He's a high-ranking military officer that is actually in charge of getting Paul safely to Rome. And I know when we hear this, we think, making that journey to Rome, that's not that big a deal. If I had to, I could be in Rome tomorrow. Yeah, it'd be a long flight. I'd probably have some jet lag for a few days, but I can make the trip pretty easy. Not the case in Paul's day, not at all. This trip was anything, anything but easy. It was a 2,500-mile trip to Rome by land. It was nearly a 2,000-mile trip by sea. Look at verse 3. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. So that was the final destination for that ship. So in order to go on to Rome, they've got to get on another ship. Look at verse 6. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Sinaitis. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of, Lee of Crete opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Look at verse 9. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because now it was after the Day of Atonement. The truth is, in that day, usually ships didn't sail any time late fall till spring because it was too dangerous. Why? Because of the weather. And we know the time frame of this voyage because it says it was after the Day of Atonement. That means it would have been in October, which would have been late fall. Definitely not a good time to set sail. So they get to this place called Fair Havens. When I hear Fair Havens, I'm thinking that's a resort town. I'm thinking that's a pretty nice place to be. Well, not according to these sailors. It was too small, probably a little bit boring for these sailors, so they don't want to spend the winter there. So they decided to sail on to the harbor of Phoenix, which was about 40 more miles away, even though it was a dangerous time to sail. I guess it didn't seem too crazy for them to try to make it to Phoenix just so they could be spared the miserable winter at Fair Havens, which doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, look at the next verse. So Paul warned them, verse 10, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority, more, majority decided, remember that point, that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. So why was Paul giving advice to this pilot and the owner of the ship? Paul may have been a preacher, but he had a lot of experience at sea. He really did. If you remember, he had been on three missionary journeys and had actually been on that sea and been on those islands along the coastline, so he was very familiar with it. He knew it well. But in 2 Corinthians 11.25, it tells us that Paul was shipwrecked not once, 
Not twice, but three times. And on one of those occasions, he spent 24 hours clinging to a plank in the open sea until he was picked up or he washed ashore. My point is, he knew the ocean. He knew the seasons of the sea, and he had experience at sea. But I want to look at how they got into the storm in the first place. Because it's how we get into a lot of our storms in the first place. Sometimes life happens. Sometimes things go wrong because of maybe of our own sin consequences. Maybe sometimes we get caught up in somebody else's sin. And sometimes it's flat out because we live in a broken world. Sometimes that's the only reason. But in this story, let's take a look at some mistakes that were made so that we maybe won't make the same mistakes. The first one, if you're taking notes, is listening to the wrong people. How many know that listening to the wrong people can get you in trouble? Anybody ever admit to that? We've all done it. God's voice seems to be drowned out in our culture more and more and more. Amen? It does. Our culture is screaming at us every day, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to live this way, you need to believe this way, you need to behave this way. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Another translation says bad company corrupts good morals. Listen, don't fool yourself at all. Because if you hang out with the wrong people, before long, chances are you're going to be doing the wrong things. It just works that way. Anyone ever heard this quote? Show me who your friends are and I'll show you your future. More true than we want to admit, amen? So my question is, who are we listening to? Who are we really letting influence our lives today? Because in this day and age we live, a culture we live in, we have to be so careful, so careful to guard our thoughts and our hearts. Every single day the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to us. But if we're listening to them and we're listening to them and them and them, guess what's going to happen? The voice of the Holy Spirit is going to be drowned out by their voices. It's going to grow dim. That was happening on this ship with Paul. The centurion, the pilot, the owner, all against Paul. And let me add this in there. Don't be intimidated by authorities or people that are important or you think more important than you because unless they're following God, they might be wrong. Chances are they're going to be wrong. The truth is we need to listen to that still, small voice of God. As a follower of Christ, God is always speaking to us. He's wanting to speak to us. He's wanting to lead us and guide us. But I guess the big question is, are we listening? But the second mistake that we can make if you're taking notes is listening to the majority. Think about this story. It was a three-to-one vote. Paul against the other three, and they're going with the majority. The Bible says we are called as Christians to be holy. That word literally means to be set apart. We are called to be different from the world. The problem is most of us as believers are scared to death to be different from the world because we don't want to be singled out. But as a Christian, I believe we should walk and we should talk so much differently than our culture does. Amen? To be a witness to the world around us. In Numbers 13, remember how God promised the Israelites the promised land? Remember what God told them? He said, take 12 spies and go out and check this land I'm about to give you. Check it out. Remember the results? Ten of the spies came back and said, no way, no way, no how. We can't take this land. The people are giants. Uh, We're outnumbered. They're too strong. We're too weak. We're fearful, so just forget about it. But only two guys came back and said, wait a minute. God told us we could have this land. We just have to trust God. And if you know the rest of the story, they took the land because they listened to God. Two against ten. So my point is, don't put your stock in the majority. Because even though there might be more of them, even a majority, that majority can be wrong. Amen? Look at verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, so the weather's looking like it's getting nicer. They saw their opportunities, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called a northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. Did you notice that phrase, the ship was caught? 
That literally means for that ship to be caught like a predator catches its prey and holds on to it, won't let go of it. This ter terrible storm has a hold of that ship, isn't letting go of it, and they couldn't control anything, so they just had to give up and let the wind take the ship where it was going to take it. Look at verse 16. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cotta, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. There was really nothing else they could do. This storm was so bad, they even threw those ropes under the ship trying to hold the ship together. Verse 18 says, We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. They're trying to lighten the ship. You know what kind of ship this was? Kind of gives it away. It was a cargo ship. It was a grain ship. And it was headed to Rome. And they weren't going to get paid for the grain if they didn't get to Rome with the grain. Look at verse 19. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. This storm was so bad. These sailors, professional sailors, were ready to give up thinking, we're going to be lost, we're all going to die. And because these sailors didn't have GPSs back then, they didn't have radar or sonar or a wife on board to guide them. <laughs> I had to throw that in. They counted on the suns and the stars to navigate by. But the problem was, because the sky was so dark, uh, they were totally lost without hope. So I just want you to get this picture uh, in mind of how, how in utter despair these guys really were. They fought this massive nor'easter for days now. They're fearful. They can't control this ship. They're throwing stuff overboard to lighten the ship. They still can't see the stars to navigate by. They're in despair, and probably every one of them, almost every one of them by now, thinks we're going to die. Look at verse 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. Paul's got one last chance, uh, and I told you so moment, and he uses it. He said, You should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Notice that Paul, all of a sudden, is the guy in charge. He's stepping up, taking charge. That's what leaders do. When difficult times hit, when everybody's burned out, it looks like there's no way out, what do leaders do? They rise up. Paul said, hey, you guys should have listened to me, but since you didn't, don't despair. Cheer up. The Lord appeared to me through a messenger, and he gave me a message of God. So Paul goes, think about this, he goes from being in captivity to being a captain. God promoted him right there on the ship. He goes from being in captivity to being a captain, but the storm rages on. Look at verse 27. On the 14th night, there are two weeks into this huge storm, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. Right now they're about 500 miles off course because of this storm, but the sailors realize that they're getting close to land because they could actually hear the waves hitting the rocks on the shore. Look at verse 28. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. You might wonder what a sounding is. A sounding back in that day was when a sailor would tie a weight to a rope. Uh, that rope would be marked with different measurements on it, and they would throw it out into the sea, and it would sink to the bottom... And when it got to the bottom, they could feel it hit. They knew it was there. They would mark it. So they knew how deep the water was. Look at verse 29. 
Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. It said they prayed for daylight. All of them prayed. I think the threat of shipwreck and death made them all become men of prayer. It's kind of like that old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. You ever heard that one? Everyone starts to pray when you're in a foxhole. Verse 30 says, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. They were pretending. Paul knew what they were up to. It says, then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. The truth is these sailors weren't concerned at all about the other people on the ship. They were just concerned about themselves. They were trying to sneak off the ship in the lifeboat, save themselves. Here again we see Paul's leadership step up, and after cutting uh, away the ropes to this small boat, there's no turning back. No other turning back, no other plan of escape. They were literally now all in the same boat. Look at verse 33. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat, For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in a constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread. He gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. Sounds a little bit like the Lord's Supper to me, amen? But it sounds like Paul's still witnessing right there in the middle of that storm. Verse 36, it says, They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Again, these men hadn't eaten for two weeks, mainly because they're probably terrified. They've been running on adrenaline for those two weeks uh, because they've been tossed up and down by the waves of this terrible storm. Paul knew they needed to eat. You know why? Because he knew they needed strength. Because he knew those guys getting to shore was not going to be an easy task because they're either going to eventually swim or they're going to sink. So they need strength. So what happened? You can read the details for yourself in verses 39 through 44 on your own. But the ship finally runs aground on an island called Malta. And the stormy seas pummel the weakened vessel, start breaking it apart. So all the guys realize we've got to jump overboard to save ourselves or we're going to be broken up with the ship. And these Roman soldiers had a plan to kill all the prisoners because if one prisoner escaped, these Roman soldiers would have been, would have been killed themselves for allowing them to escape. So they, again, they're looking out for themselves. But the centurion that was in charge of Paul had learned to trust Paul, had learned to trust Paul's word, so he's determined that just as Paul said, God's going to get everybody to shore. Some swam, some clung to anything that would float, but all 276 soldiers, prisoners, and hardened sailors made it to dry land, alive, just as the Lord had promised Paul, just as God said. But real quick, I want you to look at a couple of spiritual anchors that Paul uses in his storm that I think we have to use in our storms whenever we face our modern-day storms. The first one, if you're taking notes, is we need God's presence. That's the first spiritual anchor we need is God's presence. Remember what Paul said in verse 23, Last night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. Paul's the only one that doesn't really lose his marbles on this ship. He's the only one that keeps his sanity because he knows who he is and he knows who he belongs to. So Paul's faith rises up because he says, I know who I am and I know who was with me last night. It was God. And he was confident that God would see him through no matter what storm was raging around him, no matter how bad it looked. Remember when you were a child, probably the safest place you could be during a storm if it was possible, probably with your dad. It probably was. I remember several years ago, we went on a family vacation to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Austin was about nine years old. His cousin Chatty was with us, and he was about 10. And they kept begging us to go into this dumb haunted house, this uh, spook house. And I don't like them anyway. I didn't want to go, but we finally agreed, okay, we'll go into the haunted house. And uh, we went in with a group of people, a huge group of people. Most of them we didn't know, 
But guess who got pushed to the front to lead the whole thing? Yeah, you guessed it. I, got, I don't know how I got that job. I didn't want that job. I don't like spook houses. Anyway, anyway uh, it was a pretty good uh, haunted house for sure. A lot of jump scares. And Austin was right on my tail end, and he had a hold of my belt and about pulled my pants down about three times. But I do remember the last thing before you got out of that haunted house you stepped into this room, and it was a cylinder-shaped room like you're in the middle of a barrel. And it had a walkway about three feet wide with handrails all the way across, about 25 feet long. And the barrel was spinning. And it had all sorts of wild colors on it, and that makes me sick. I mean, I'm, I get sick easy. So anyway, I'm looking at that thing, and I'm, I have trouble standing up, and I'm standing still. I'm looking at that thing spinning, and I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to make it across? About that time, I decided, well, close your eyes and run straight across. And basically, I did that. I had to peek along the way. But anyway, I made it. And I got to the other side, and I realized Austin's not with me. And he's screaming. He's on the other side, and he's got his grips on this handrail. He's shaking. His eyes are closed, and he's screaming. I tried to coach him across. You can do it, Austin. I did it. You can do it. You can make it. No matter how I coached and how I coached coached him and prodded him to come along, he wouldn't. So I thought, oh boy, I got to go in reverse. I got to go back across that thing. So I take running off through that barrel again, and I do make it to him. And I grabbed him up in my arms. And he put his head in my chest. And he stopped screaming. And you know why? Dad was there. Dad was there. You know, with all all you've heard about this story we're talking about, I want you to put yourself on that ship for just a minute with Paul and all those others on that stormy sea knowing what you know now. How would your behavior be different than the others on the ship knowing that your heavenly Father is right there with you? It makes all the difference. How many know that for a fact? It makes all the difference. The second spiritual anchor, if you're taking notes, is we need to trust in God's promises. Not our feelings, but His promises. My question is, what are you being led by today? What's directing your decisions, your actions, your words, and your thoughts? How many have ever made a decision because it simply felt right? How many have ever said something because it felt like the perfect moment? I know I have. There have been times in my life I have totally let my feelings lead and guide. My feelings led my actions in every step that I took, and a lot of those weren't good steps. But here's the truth. Feelings lie. Do you realize that? Feelings lie. They lie to us all the time. There's an old country song that some of you might recognize. How can it be wrong when it feels so right? Are you kidding me? (laughs) There are a lot of things that are wrong that seem really right in the moment. I think of one, how about the old fanny pack? Anybody remember the fanny packs? You go back on the family vacations about 10, 20 years ago, men, women, and children were wearing fanny packs. How about their, those that wear socks with their Crocs? Some of you still do that. And ladies, how many of you wore those leg warmers over your jeans? And I'm not even going to ask you men if you ever did that. I don't want to hear about it. My point is, these things might have felt right at the time. But looking back, I'll have to say your emotions lied to you. (laughs) Big time. The Bible is quick to tell us that our feelings, our hearts, cannot be trusted. The Bible literally says we cannot trust our own hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can understand it another translation says it's desperately wicked proverbs 14 12 says there is a way that appears to be right but in the end it leads to death think about it many friendships have died many marriages have been killed many relationships destroyed simply because people trusted in their emotions rather than let God uh, guide their decisions. The Apostle Paul and his shipmates were battered by this terrible storm, and it looked like there was no hope. But then Paul remembers. God stood 
beside him once before in Acts 23, told him, you're going to go to Rome, you're going to testify about me. Then once more, we just mentioned it today, the Lord spoke to Paul again and assured him that he's going to stand trial before Caesar. So despite all that they're going through in this terrible, terrible storm that they're going through, there was no need to fear. And Paul knew that because God had made him a promise. He was going to get to Rome. God had made him a promise, and he was going to keep that promise. Aren't you glad we serve a God that when he makes a promise, he'll keep that promise? It may not be in your time. It probably won't be. It may not be in my time, but he will keep the promise. You might say, that'd be nice if God would speak to us in our storms. He does. He has. He gives us this word. Amen? He gives us this word to guide us. He's given us scripture that we need to hide in our hearts. We need to fill our hearts with his word, especially his promises, and claim them. We need to hold on to those promises. Amen? If you want to know God's promises, you've got to go to the word of God. You won't find them without it. The Bible covers it all. Marriage, relationships, parenting, communication, forgiveness, decision-making, finances, temptations. Everything you go through. And here's a good test to test your faith, if it's real faith or not. Does what you're feeling line up with the Word of God? Does what you're feeling line up with the Word of God? Because if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, no matter how strong that feeling is, you can't trust it. So when your circumstances and God's promises don't seem to line up together, just know that God will keep His Word. He'll keep His promise. And when wave after wave seems to crash down on it, just trust that the God whom you belong whom you trust and serve, has promised to bring you and me safely to shore. Thank you, Jesus. You might be going through a storm right now. And if you're not, you will be. You're either coming out of a storm, you're in one right now, or you're getting ready to go through some rough waters. So let me ask you this question. Is Jesus the captain of your ship? If he's not, he needs to be. Because in the storms of life, he's the anchor. He's the anchor that's going to hold our soul. You know, in our story, the anchor of that ship failed and it failed and it failed. They had several anchors. They all failed. Jesus, the anchor of our lives, will never fail. When we have God's presence and we believe in God's promises, then we can have God's peace. Amen? That's what brings His peace. So if you need God's peace today, God is in the house. The Holy Spirit is in the house to bring the peace that you need that the Word says passes understanding, goes beyond your imagination, that is a better peace than you could ever even imagine. But it only comes from Him. It only comes from trusting in Him, living in His presence, believing in His promises, and realizing that God's got me. No matter how bad the storm rages on, and the storms will rage, but God never changes. Could you stand to your feet? If you need prayer for anything, I invite you to come. And if you're in a storm right now, or maybe you're stuck in a storm, I want you to come up for prayer. I believe the power of the Holy Spirit is in this house right now. I know the power of the Holy Spirit is in the house right now. He's right here in our midst. So if you have a need for anything, it doesn't even have to be about anything I talked about. But if it is, it is. If it isn't, God still knows what you need. God will provide So you can come up right now or you can come up after service, but we'll be down here to pray. But could you just bow your hearts in prayer with me? Father God, I thank you that you love us so much. I thank you, Lord God, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the anchor of our soul. That no matter what storms blow in this life, that we can trust in you, we can believe in you, we can rest in you, we can have peace in you. We can know that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. I thank you, Lord God, that you are on the throne. You're still in control in the midst of our storms. Father, help us to stand strong in our faith. Help us to trust in your promises as we go through our storms. And may we always remember that you're with us and you're going to see us through as we depend upon you, as we keep trusting in you. I give you thanks for all that you've done today, Lord God. I thank you for your precious word. I thank you for the truth that sets the captives free. I thank you, Lord God, for the things that you've done in every heart represented here today. They may not even realize it yet, but I believe, as your word says, it won't return void. I believe things are being accomplished right now and have been accomplished today. 
And I pray as we leave this place, you would turn us into the men and women. Help us to become the men and women you've created us to be. All for your glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Can we put our hands together for God as we dismiss? God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.